Hey guys, it's Ted Bogert. Welcome back to The Ted Show. We continue our series celebrating Black History Month. And if I tell you I'm honored to have this gentleman as a friend, but also on the show, the one and only Belvin Perry Jr. Belvin is on the show. He's going to share his journey. He's got a great history. Um, and we're going to talk about Black History Month. And this is all part of the Citrus Club initiative where we are uh, doing a series with our board of governors. I am honored to serve on the board with Mr. Perry. Belvin, welcome to the show. How are you today? Ted, I'm doing fine. I'm good, glad to be good. on your show. I'm honored when I tell you I'm honored. And when people saw I posted it, I told you some of the questions I got asked before. We're not That's not what this show is about, but uh, you definitely have a fan base that's big and people love you. Uh, so for those people who might be under a rock the last however many years, uh, they love origin stories. So tell them a little bit about you and your journey uh, to becoming an attorney, then a judge, uh, and all of the good stuff in between. Okay. I'm one of those rare individuals that were, was born here uh, in Orlando, Florida. I was Amazing. born on uh, Anderson Street, which at the time was known as Holden Street. I was born at home. I grew up in Orlando, uh, which at the time uh, was uh, segregated. Uh, we lived in our small community. Uh, we lived on South Street and eventually moved to Washington Shores. I attended Jones High School. I was a proud member of uh, James Chief Wilson's marching and concert band. I was also in the chess club. I was fortunate to have two uh, wonderful parents, my dad, Belvin Sr., uh, along with Richard Arthur Jones, became the first two black law enforcement officers for the city of Orlando starting uh, January 3rd, 1951. Wow. My mom uh, was a school teacher. Uh, I left uh, in 68 to attend uh, Tuskegee Institute, which is now Tuskegee University, where I received my BS degree and master's degree. Uh, I came back home because I completed my graduate studies early, a semester early, with uh, the plan intention of going to law school, which I did. I had the privilege of working with one of our board members who gave me a job, Paul Snead, yes. with uh, the old DYS Division of Youth Services. Uh, and uh, I came back after I finished law school and uh, I started my legal career uh, at the Office of the State Attorney. December 1st, 1977. Wow. I, I rose through the ranks, uh, ended up uh, being chief assistant state attorney where I ran the day-to-day -day operations and tried most of the major landmark cases uh, in Orlando during that time, uh, a number of homicides and uh, some politicians. And then I got this wild idea <laughs> about running for judge. I had tried to get appointed seven times. Really? Never could get out of committee because I had a reputation as a tough, hard-nosed prosecutor. But the cases that I tried were the cases that we did not plea bargain on. Uh, and uh, there were a lot of homicide cases. Uh, I was fortunate enough to run in Orange and Osceola County. I uh, was elected. Uh, and took office in uh, 89, January of 89. I spent 25 years wow. on the bench. 18 of those 25 years, I was the chief judge of the Ninth Judicial Circuit. And now uh, I retired uh, in uh, the end of August of 2014. My retirement lasted three long days <laughs> and uh, I, I joined a wonderful law firm of uh, Morgan and Morgan. So uh, lifelong resident, I, I have seen 
the dark days of uh, segregation, discrimination, and I've seen how this community has blossomed and changed. Uh, and I'm proud to say that I love my community uh, and we are a community of one, even though we have issues we need to iron out every now and then, but we are one collective family Great. and I'm proud to be a Central Florida resident. So I have so many questions for you. First of all, what did you do in the band? I was a percussionist. When you play for James Chief Wilson, my primary instrument was the snare drum, but I learned uh, how to play uh, the chimes, the bells, a little bit with the xylophone. <laughs> Do you still play? No, I, I have not touched a pair of drumsticks now in about 15 years. Uh, but I was a percussionist and you know, that's why I developed my taste for classical music. You know, we we played the New World Symphony, uh, uh, 1812 Overture, yeah. uh, in, in a number of classical works. Did you, did you find as a, let's move a little bit to the prosecutor part, because when you said <clears throat> you were known as a tough prosecutor, I've never seen that side of you, obviously, in the time I've known you. So uh, that fascinates me. What is it that made you tough? Well, when you have the most horrendous cases, cases that uh, one example of a case that I had was a man by the name of Jerry Correll. My co-prosecutor was Ray Sharp. Mr. Correll had uh, killed his ex-wife, his own daughter, his ex-sister-in-law, and his ex-mother-in-law. Wow. He stabbed them to death out in Conway. Each one of them had uh, at least 20 stab wounds. His daughter had 15 stab wounds. Uh, prosecuted a horrible case at the James K. Ramsey Insurance Company, which was at the time, which is uh, located uh, on Mills uh, Avenue. Yeah. Uh, I could go on and on, and those were the cases that uh, th there was no redeeming factors to justify any type of mercy. Right. Uh, so that's how I got the reputation, but also in cases where people, since I was in charge of criminal intake, also people who deserve second chances and people who deserve mercy, uh, it was given. It's awesome. Uh, but if you were a bad hombre, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, we just didn't give away the courthouse. I mean, good, you know, good to know that you have that side. I've only ever seen the sweet side of you. Um, but I understand that is that must be life changing to have to sit there, see all the graphic pictures, I'm sure, and know uh, the suffering that went on. And then you want to get justice for uh, the victims. What was it like to move to once you once you finally became a judge? Um, what was that like going from being an attorney to actually sitting on the bench? Was it everything you dreamed of? Uh, the day after, were you like, why was I pushing this so much? What was your, what was your experience um, on the bench? It was a life-changing, eye-opening experience because one of the things you have to realize, there's no such thing as cookie cutter justice. Yeah. That when an individual comes before you, that's their day in court. And you just can't assume that the person is just guilty. Uh, you have to be open-minded. You have to be able to look at all sides. And then you have to realize that the decision that you make in a particular case, not only is it gonna affect a defendant, but it affects the community at large. Right. And you have somebody's, uh, fate in your hands. 
and they want you to look at their case individually, not as a collection of cases where you just don't care and you go through the motions. Yes. Uh, because whether we like it or not, there are innocent people that will come before the bar of justice. And, and I, I came across a number of those people. Um, and, uh, and unfortunately, I had one that came, went to trial, was convicted. But I knew that that person was not guilty. Uh, during the PSI, I asked the probation department to do certain things. And when they brought the report back, it showed that the person was innocent. So wow. you just don't sit there like a potted plant. Yeah, uh, It's your job. That's why uh, the taxpayers uh, elect judges and not computers. Yes. Why did you leave? Why did you decide you wanted to retire? Did Mrs. Perry go, okay, I've had enough of this judge? Uh, what was the impetus behind that? Well, I had done 12 years as a prosecutor. I had done uh, 25 years as a judge. And, uh, you know, I was at the top of my game. And uh, in terms of, uh, you know, I, I had basically maxed out of everything. And one of the things I, I, I looked at was, it was after the year 2013 when I worked, uh, with the exception of 21 days in 2013, I worked seven days a week, wow. nonstop. Uh, and that, that July, I, I looked at my retirement statement and the difference between me sitting at home and working was $25,000. <laughs> and, uh, Sometimes you can stay around a place too long. Uh, and I had spent, you know, uh, about 37 years in the court system as a prosecutor and a judge. And to me, it was time to move on. And I had a golden opportunity to do what I really wanted to do when I got out of law school was to do personal injury work. And uh, I've had that opportunity since uh, 2014. Was it a different world when you left the bench and you went back to being a private uh, private practice, uh, being an attorney? Was it completely different? Was the system a challenge because you had been on the other side? Uh, what was the transition like for you? The transition was relatively smooth. The first thing you realize is that you, you you don't have any control over anything. You're not the judge anymore. Yeah. <laughs> you have to get used to uh, dealing with clients. Uh, you have to get used to dealing with uh, other attorneys again. And uh, and in the world of personal injury, you have to uh, get used to dealing with insurance companies. So uh, it was uh, a good transition. It, yeah. it, it was it was totally different from going from being in charge of the entire court system uh, to being just a regular lawyer. Yeah, that's that to me. It, that shows your passion and your love for the law and for the system. I mean, I, I think it's so cool that you've done pretty much all things and continue to do continue to practice. I think that's awesome. All right, let me ask you about Black History Month. I was going to say Citrus Club. We're doing this series because we have several um, Black board governor uh, governors on the board, and we uh, want to learn from each of you, do you celebrate Black History Month? And if you do, what do you do specifically? Well... I just don't celebrate Black History Month during the month of February. I, I think it's very important uh, to 
keep learning about the contributions of African Americans year round. Yeah. Uh, people who don't remember their history are often doomed to repeat the mistakes of the past. And, uh, you know, usually during this time, I take the opportunity uh, to talk with folks and, and, and speak on different black history programs. I'm going to be doing one uh, because of COVID uh, in April uh, with the uh, Pine Castle Women's Club. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to do uh, pay a visit to uh, uh, the Clarence Otis uh, Boys and Club, Boys and uh, Girls Club. Uh, and do a talk with some of their students one afternoon. Uh, so it, it's, you celebrate, it's a nice you celebrate time. all year long, really. You're always in. You're always celebrating. That's we get that answer. I've gotten that answer a couple of times. It's great to have the month to bring awareness, but you live it, eat it, and breathe it on a daily basis, and are always trying to be out there, uh, bringing awareness to the amazing things that go on in our community. I have to ask um, when, if we listen to the news and you pay attention, uh, it seems like everything's uh, negative and we're going backwards. Uh, what What's your feeling about um, race relations and uh, where we're at now? Do you feel like we have stepped back? Do you feel like we still have made good progress and continue to do so? What's your feeling? Well, I, I think we've made significant progress. I, I think uh, that uh, we have miles to go. I think we are at a point uh, in this nation that we are sort of at the point where we're like on a, a, a treadmill. We're doing a lot of running, we're doing a lot of talking, but we're not dealing with the issues that continue uh, to separate us. I think we've seen, much to everybody's surprise, a resurgence of hate groups that now feel empowered to openly uh, express their hate. Uh, and of course, we all have that freedom of speech, but it shows you that for all the progress we've made, uh, we still have those among us yes. who want to turn back the hands of time. I agree. And it is quite disturbing when people don't say anything about it. If you see something, speak out about it. Yes. Uh, and as long as people be, are able to hide in the shadows and those who come out publicly, uh, they're able to speak that hatred and there are no consequences for speaking hatred. And I'm not talking about silencing them, but I'm talking about saying, hey, you're wrong. Right. You're entitled to believe what you want to believe, but these are the facts. Everybody's entitled to their opinion. But that being said, your opinion is not necessarily right. That's right. And if you're, I feel like if you're spewing hate all the time, if that's really protected under free speech, it's one thing. But the consequences, I feel like we definitely are seeing a lot of the consequence. These people are coming out. And that's another thing that I want to point out and see if you agree. I feel like the people were always there, but there's been an encouragement of, hey, it's okay to speak that because there is no consequence for you speaking that. And I feel like uh, these people who have become more vocal have always existed, but now they've been empowered to be more vocal about it uh, because they're not seeing any kind of uh, ramifications for that kind of hate. Do you see the same thing? Ted, you're exactly right. There was a time uh, in society where people would speak that type of hatred. They would be shunned. Yeah. They would be isolated. But unfortunately, 
that doesn't occur as much as it should occur. Agreed. I agree. It's very scary. And, it, and you keep, when I read some of the things and I see some of the things, I just think even five years ago, we wouldn't have seen this or 10 years ago. It just, it always existed in the background and you're, I'm not naive enough to think that it just all of a sudden sprouted out and these people never existed. It was still there. It just, we kept it in check a little better, uh, I feel like. And so um, I am, I'm excited to see some more progress to shut some of that hatred down. Uh, it's an honor to have you on the show, Belvin. I appreciate your friendship. I appreciate all you do in the community and what you've done for us. I think it, there is so much good that you've done over time. And I know you could share a lot of stories with us. Paul shared a very similar story about the band. Um, and so I love, I would love to take a deep dive into that at some point. Uh, but before we head out, I'd love to know if I say the word hero, who's the first person that comes to mind for you? Uh, Arthur Pappy Kennedy. And tell me why. Okay. Arthur Pappy Kennedy, first of all, um, uh, was my Sunday school teacher at Shallow Baptist Church. Arthur Pappy Kennedy was a very humble, but community oriented individual. He did something that everyone said was an impossibility. He ran for the Orlando City Council, not for from a single member district designed to elect a person of color, but he ran citywide and he won, even though he had to go to court to win. Uh, and when I was in his, in his Sunday school class, these were the things that each and every one of us there, not only did we, 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 we learn uh, about the Bible uh, and faith and, and, and religion, we, we learned about certain values, integrity, character, being uh, able to uh, treat people like you wanted to be treated, uh, public speaking, and service to your community. And he used to amplify that, that you can't expect your community to be better if you stay on the sidelines and do nothing but complain. Amen to that. So Arthur Pappy Kennedy to me was a hero. There, there, there are many of us like Nat Ford who uh, was elected when they went to single member district who was my PE teacher. Uh, and it, there's just so many different people that I was blessed to encounter growing up here in Orlando. And I would venture to bet money that there are a lot of people who look at you the same way, Belvin. So thank you for being on the show. Always a joy to spend time with you. Um, I've tagged you and everything. So if you all want to reach out, um, don't show up at Belvin's house, but you can reach out to him on social media. <laughs> um, and he's just as amazing in, in person and in the community is here. Thank you so much, Belvin, for coming on the Thanks show. Thanks for having me, and I truly enjoyed it. Appreciate you. All right. You guys have a good one. We'll be back later on. Go out and celebrate.